Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. So glad you could join me. I have a special person with me here tonight. I have Dr. Rita Louise, and she has written so many wonderful books. Uh, the, the last one that we did was on her book about the narcissist and the spiritual empath, and <clears throat> in that book I, disco- I discovered, to my horror, that I was one of those dancers. So in reading her new book, Dang, it was me all along. Cultivate happiness through mindful awareness. I did discover that a lot of the things she talked about applied to me much more than I really, really, really wanted to admit. Let me tell you a little bit about the book. Have you been praying for more happiness in your life? Learn how to change. <clears throat> Learn how to take charge of your emotional well-being. The truth is, most of us don't know what makes us tick. We move through life unaware of what makes us happy and what makes us sad. And Until you learn who you are and what you want, you'll struggle with your relationship with yourself and, of course, everyone else. Dr. Rita is the author of Dysfunctional Dance of the Empath and the Narcissist, and she offers powerful guidance to what is going on inside of each of us, each and every one of us. In Dang It With Me All Along cuts through all the psychological mumbo-jumbo to show you how to find inner peace and contentment. Dr. Rita reveals how to mindfully look inward and remake yourself from the inside out. And this book uses a unique blend of scientific data sprinkled with entertaining stories and frank commentary of her own pursuit of happiness that will make you laugh, think, and grow and Recognize yourself in more places than you probably want to want to admit to. You can't change your past, but by applying the principles of this book, you can transform your future and your life. You'll be captivated from the opening sentence and will find anecdote, anecdotal steps in each chapter to guide you on your journey. And by the time you finish the book, you may no longer recognize the person you used to be. So are you ready to throw down the gauntlet and say, I want happiness and really mean it? Then this book is what you need. Dr. Rita is a best-selling author and the founder of the Institute of Applied Energetics and the host of Just Energy Radio. She's a naturopathic physician and a 20-year veteran in the human potential field. Her unique gift as a medical intuitive and clairvoyant, clairvoyant illuminates and enlivens her work She's the author of the books E.T. Chronicles, What Myth and Legend Have to Say About Human Origin, Avoiding the Cosmic Two Times Four, Dark Angels, An Insider's Guide to Ghost Spirits and Attached Entities, and The Power Within. And she's also produced a number of video feature-length and feature-length videos, as well as short videos. She is multi-talented and a charming and wonderful person to share and, 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 and to learn from. So welcome to the show, Dr. Rita. Thanks for having me, Barbara. How are you? 
I am absolutely fabulous. How are you? I am wonderful. So glad to be here with you and your listeners to hang out and talk. <laughs> well, I have and to tell you. And important stuff. Well, you know, it's it's really fascinating because in your book about the narcissist and the, and the empath, I I read that book and then I went back and read it again and I and I said, "Damn, she's talking to me." And had to really admit to a lot of the stuff in that book and and I have to admit that this book was the same. I found myself saying, "Son of a damn, that I do that." And that's why the title is Dang. It was me all along because it's like, oh, man, I thought I fixed all that. But no. (laughs) Well, I I think one of the first places we we notice these um, issues within ourselves is in our relationships with other people. But the reality is, you know, it's it's an ongoing thing that that gets set early on in life. And it it took me back to when I was, God, third grade, second grade, third grade, and you know how cruel kids can be. Um, they A whole bunch of them started calling me Long Nose DeLong. And it impacted me to the point where I hid from cameras, I hid from my safe. I thought I was ugly, and mm-hmm. it wasn't. It wasn't so much an outside, you know. It, it, it was. It was inside that 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 sort of took hold, and it was with me for a very, very, very long time. And, and until you know, I did some searching and I did some work, and you know, I realized that you know I had grown into my nose, so it wasn't you know as big as. Uh, you know, it really, it's cruel what kids can do to kids. And well, you know, it's not just always kids. You know, I share a story talking about the programming we take on as kids, you know, because that kind of sets the tone for how we experience the world when we're older. And I had an oh, yeah. uncle. So see, this wasn't even a kid. This was my uncle. <clears throat> And he used to call me funny looking. I mean, just regular. You know, it wasn't just once or twice. That's what he called me, funny looking. And so I just was like, I must be really freaking horrid and thought I was just ugly. And I have learned <laughs> that that's not the case. And yeah. um, But still, you know, there's that part, and I bet this happens to you too, that you look in the mirror, and I bet you, like, look at your nose and go, oh, no, it's not that big. <laughs> <laughs> I do. And, and, you know, it's really funny because when I look in the mirror, um, I, I have told people forever that the camera does not like me. And it's true because when I when a picture is taken of me and I look at that picture and I look in the mirror, it's not the same person. And I think there's a great deal to be said about how we radiate what we believe about ourselves. And a long time ago, people were saying, you have to put your picture up on your, your stuff on the Internet. And I, I said, no, 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 I don't think so. And they finally convinced me. And I went to a photographer, and, and they took dozens, of, well, probably more than that, pictures. And I looked at all of them, and I said, that's not me. And they said, yeah, it is. You know, you. And I said, no, you don't understand. I'm an animated person. And if you take a picture of me sitting, it becomes flat. You have to take pictures of me talking about myself and my work. And they did. And the pictures are the ones that are on my website and everything now. They're actually good pictures. And it's mm-hmm. because who I believed in and was emulating at that time was not the person that was sitting there, you know, not breathing while they took pictures. And I think people have to understand that even cameras will, will take what you radiate. And and it's it's interesting, you know, people, I see lots of pictures of me where I'm just standing next to my son or my grandkids, and it doesn't look like me. It's not me. 
<laughs> it's just not me. But I think you have to come to a point where you say, that's not me. That's not the person inside. Now, why isn't it showing? And your book helps a lot. Well, and that's one big topic. I mean, it's not the only topic, but to me it was a big topic to put out there to people is that we don't realize that who we are on the inside is being projected out into the world. And we've all had the experience where, you know, we go to work and you're in a meeting and there's someone that just got really bad energy or you're at a party or, you know, you interact with someone and they just have really bad energy and they don't even do anything. They might not even say a word, but you can just feel it, you know, or they might have really good energy and you just feel it. And we don't realize that we're sending it out every day, 24 seven, all the time, and everybody around us can pick up the vibe we're sending out. So are we sending out a good vibe, <laughs> or are we sending out a bad vibe, and the people around us are going, oh, they got funky energy. I don't even want to be around them. <laughs> well, you, you know, know but other... it's something that you have to kind of consider, in my opinion. It's like, hmm, never really thought of that, but it's true. Well, yeah, the other thing that, that, you know, resonated to me particularly was that we are magnets and we draw to us people who are radiating the same kind of energy. And I, I, I tell people all the time, especially women who are looking for the one, and, <clears throat> you know, one woman said, all I attract are losers. And I said, if you feel that strongly, then that's what you feel about yourself, and you need to be able to project, project something different to to draw in other people. It's not other people's faults. We are magnets, and we pull to ourselves people who are in the same energetic. And I, I think that when I really understood that, it you know I took a good look at the people around me, and I realized that that was exactly what was happening. And and it it made can I, me. Can I put a little caveat in there though? A little sure. caveat. Um, Absolutely. There are people that put out really good energy. They tend to be the people pleasers or the codependents or the fawners of the world. And okay, that is the energy they're putting out there. That I'm willing to put up with anything. But it is uh-huh. also that right forgiving, loving energy that attracts the narcissist like flies to honey. And so, you know, some of it is also taking ownership and awareness of, okay, you know, I could be attracting this and maybe I just don't need to stay. You know, if you constantly are attracting losers, then why are you staying? You know, once you figure out they're a loser, why are you staying? Yeah, but then then it comes into, well, do I feel that's all I deserve? And if that's the case, I think your book is so is so good on pointing out the fact that you can change yourself. Yeah, you know, that there's that saying out there: change your life, change your world. It's true. <laughs> but but you know we're responsible for ourselves, not 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 the not the we are responsible for what we attract to ourselves, but. It's important to to realize that okay, so if there's a series of people that are really, you know, really stressing me out and really drawing energy from me, then then I need to find other people Go. to surround me with. <laughs> yeah, to walk yeah. away. Walking away <laughs> is the hardest thing in the world to do. Well, you know, I mean, when it, I sat there and I was working on this process of change. You know, I thought it was going to be really hard. You know, like I would have to be like meditating all the time, doing all this stuff all the time. I I wasn't really sure what, but I didn't think it was going to be easy. But it turned out to be, in the big picture of things, really easy to do, you know, technique-wise and practice-wise. Now, where the challenge came in (coughs) was in that comment 
the ability to walk away, to the, the ability to sit there and go, I value myself enough that I don't need to allow my energy to be drained or be sucked on or be manipulated or be invalidated by anybody because you're hurting my energy and it's my responsibility to maintain and take care of my energy, my happiness. And if if you're not, and I'm not saying that they have to do anything, but if they are taking away from that, that's a better way of saying it. If they're taking away from that and it's happening on a regular basis, then you need to stop and reevaluate and and that's the hardest part. And making and sometimes making that choice of this is what's best for me, even if it means walking out the door. Oh yeah. I think the last time that I walked away from it was a relationship. I found myself saying, I am lonelier with this person than I am without them. And when I hit that point, it was like, okay, that's it. I don't need to go any further with this. And I think what what hits you is, you know, well, you want to be kind to the person. They need help. They need compassion. But but all they do is drain you of those issues. They don't take Mm -hmm. them and use them. You know, they just suck it up. If they're like vampires. <laughs> well, they are vampires. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and one of the things that I found, you know, so I joke around with some of my girlfriends, and, and we created, I created, the Dumb Girl Club, you know, and it's this group ah. of freaking brilliant women, okay, brilliant women that make these really dumb relationship choices, Thus, the dumb girl club. It's like, okay, you know, met this guy, and then it turned into, like, a crap show, you know, and it's like, yeah. oh, what was I thinking? You know, he lives in his mother's basement, doesn't have a job, yeah. you know, blah, 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 but I want to stay in this relationship. How stupid is that? You've already, you already been there. You've done that. You wrote, got the shirt. You got the cup. You got the pen. In my case, you wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> and you're still going there. It's like, what am I thinking? And so sometimes if you can just sit there and go, you know, I've already been down this road several times, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that again. <laughs> maybe I need to, like, make different choices and, you know, have some rules of engagement of, you know, this. You know, these are the things that are deal breakers for me. And when you go into the relationship – Hold those because these are important to me because if there are things that are deal breakers, you know, like you don't have a job, you don't have a car, you know, whatever the thing is. I mean, I had I had a two-page list. Um, then you're saving yourself from being hurt because if that's a behavior that they exhibit and you put up with it, but it's on your deal breaker list, you're only going to end up being hurt down the road, oh, yeah. over and over again, potentially. I used to counsel young girls in their early 20s, and I would say, okay, look, you need to have a deal-breaker list. What are they? And they'll be different for everybody. And and you, you write it down in red ink, and you laminate it, and you stick it in your wallet. And you can never – those are your red flags. That would be the and bigger wallet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well – and basically, I said, you know, if there's one red flag, you walk away. And I and I said, I promise you, if you don't walk away, it can turn into a cancer in the relationship at some point in time. Mm-hmm. So save yourself the trouble. And um, I can't tell you how many women, you know, 20 years later, show me they still have that red flag list in their wallet, and they will say, you know, it saved me a couple of times here. Um, mm-hmm. So... So, but okay. So, when you recognize that you have one of these issues, whatever it is, how do you go inside yourself to change it? Because that's what has to be done. But it's not done. about going inside and changing it. It's about becoming more aware of. Okay, so I'm going to attack your question in a very 
different ang- from a very different angle. Okay. So when we are experiencing happiness or joy or contentment or excitement or passion, we feel good. We're happy inside. Our energy is vibrating high. We feel connected to the universe and and source and, and life is good. And so if the goal is you want to maintain that level of vibration, you want to stay in that happy place, then anything that happens to you that drops your energy down and you can feel it being sucked from you or you're being invalidated or hurt in some way, that's when you have to stop and take a step back from whatever the thing is and go, huh, I wonder what's going on. And huh, is it me or did they, you know, is it something that they did? And sometimes that separation is a little bit challenging to make, but once you take that step back, you can make the observation, and from that observation, then you can decide perhaps a different course of action because the goal is to keep your energy high. Absolutely. You know, and it might not be and it might not be that they did anything. I'm going to give you a perfect example. So this past weekend, I was at my boyfriend's house and we were having a conversation about his kids which I'm not even it was I I was saying some very blunt things to him about his kids. I'll just leave it there. Okay. Um and <clears throat> Well, and if you know me, you know that I can just be like, well, you know. Anyway, and so we we were in the car, and we get back to the house, we go in the house, and then he, like, walks out the door and is gone. So, um, you know, I mean, the car was still there. So I, like, go outside, kind of went around to the back, don't see him, don't see him. Like a half an hour goes by. So now... Because of my training and my programming, I'm thinking, wow, he must have been really upset with what we talked about. And, you know, he's gone for a walk somewhere but didn't tell me. And I don't even know. And now I'm ready to get in my car and leave. So this is. So it turned out that he went to go lay in the sun. So he's been doing this, like, sun therapy thing. And so he went uh-huh. to go lay in the cell. And when I finally found him, because he was on the other side, he has a hot tub. He was on the other side of the hot tub. And I heard this noise, and I go around the hot tub, and he's laying there, and he was fine. He didn't have no issue with me. He didn't have an issue about our conversation. And so all the crazy was in my head. And that was uh-huh. like a really big hello moment for me to make me stop and go, wow. It was a nothing burger, and look at the reaction you just had to it. So it's something that I'm kind of evaluating to see what that's about in me, because that's a me thing. That's not like he did anything other than walk out the door to go lay in the yeah, sun in his backyard. Yeah, I think I probably would have had the same inner, oh, my God, what did I do? And mm-hmm. uh I can I can understand that. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I've mm-hmm. done that frequently. I I I think there are times that that, that I, with every individual, I think you you take a, a different approach and stuff like that. I I had a relationship a long time ago where something didn't go right, and instead of me agonizing over it, I started the conversation with. I may have misunderstood you, but this is what I heard. And, you mm-hmm. know, I got the, the eyebrows raised and everything. I said, oh, that's not what I meant at all. I said, okay, mm-hmm. can we talk about it? Now, prior to that, well, I would have been. Was that a change of tactic for you? Would you have just sat there and ruminated and thought about it for days and days and days and days and days, and, days, and the choice you made, was to actually go talk about it, which was perhaps a different choice than you would have maybe made earlier. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and so, and that's the change part. Making a different choice is the change part, whatever that choice is. Is this this then, and, and, and I think it's important for people to realize, this is an ongoing process because we're always mm-hmm. going to be challenged in different ways. And figuring out the right approach that is healthiest for you is really, you know, is something that we are constantly working on. And I think that your book, just, you know, it, it, it smacks you in the face with this. It's like, you know, come on. You may have been behaving this way for the first 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of your life. I have that many years under my belt. That that maybe something that, that some, some form or habit that I have formed um, is not as appropriate for me at this point in time in my life, and maybe I need to look at how to respond in different ways. You know, when How, you make a choice to do something differently, it can be a bit of a white knuckle experience, you know, and it could take every bit of your gumption to do it, up to including uh-huh. walking out the door. That can be one of the hardest choices that you make, but I think everyone in retrospect will recognize that when they make that choice, it was the right choice. It was the smart choice. It might take a while, um, but but once you kind of own that process and own the, I know I need to do this, and I know this is going to make me feel better, it makes it a little easier. You know, when it's talking about, like, communicating with people, you know, if that's where you get stuck, you know, it becomes easier. You might not wait three weeks before you have a conversation <laughs> with someone. <laughs> I, I think, too, there was another part in your book that, that I resonated to for a, a gazillion reasons. You you taught, you were going through a difficult time, and then everything started to fall apart, and and you realize, you know, you, you you got sick and all sorts of things happened, and yet when you ended the connection you had, a lot of this stuff went away. So our body will, will try to signal us that, that something needs to change if something is terribly off inside of us. Very much so. You know, like... <clears throat> You know, and I'm just going to use this in a very generic way, you know, but stress will wreak havoc on our bodies. And Absolutely. what stresses me out might be different from what stresses you out, you know. And so when I share that story, I had a relationship that was falling apart or I was getting sick of it. Uh, and I was in a financial quandary, financial crisis, both at the same time. So if you want to pick my top two things, you know, that could happen in my life, that would be them, <laughs> especially the money part. And, oh, yeah. um, but it's interesting, Barbara, because the money part is the part that I've worked on the most, even though I haven't really, like, worked on it, but I – and. Uh, it doesn't, all right, every so often it will scare me, but now I just am like, you know, the universe has taken care of you all of these years. I mean, I remember a time where I was married, uh, my husband's two kids lived with us, and Christmas was just over, we bought Christmas gifts, and there was $500 in the bank, and he wasn't working, and I had my business, and I was doing my internship for school, you know, and it was like, okay. And after, like, crying a little bit because it scared the crap out of me. Sure. You know, everything turned around because the universe takes care of me, and I know that the universe takes care of me. You know, so when we can trust that what's happening or where we're being guided, or the choice that we feel very confident in making from a a soul level, not an ego level, but from a soul level, um, you know, part of that is just trusting that 
what we're doing is for our highest good and for our best purpose. And even if it might suck in the moment. <laughs> Which yeah, can big time. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. I I think I think what what really fascinates me is that the body really the spirit within really does try to give us signals when something is off kilter, when something is not right. <clears throat> it tries to slow us down, it kind of puts the brakes on, it does all sorts of stuff and if we don't pay attention, it gets worse and worse and worse. And and you're right. The universe always takes care of us in spite of us it takes care of us and i i can't well, you know, say the number after i wrote the dang book you know which i kind of tied to the dysfunctional dance of the empath and narcissist book i came to realize that it also ties in real well with one of my other books which is called avoiding the cosmic two by four which is a book about exactly what you're talking about, how our body manifests disease because there's something going on inside of us. There's something bothering us that we're not paying attention to, not paying attention to, not paying attention to, and it's like the whack up the side of the head. It's like, okay, now you have high blood pressure. Huh? (laughs) Now you have diabetes. Huh? You know, and, yeah, there are things you can do to, you know, lower your blood sugar, but there's always some emotional piece tied to the disease that our body is creating. And so if you use not feeling good and the illness as the wake-up call, like, ooh, there's something going on inside of me that I need to address, like, then you can use the tools in the dang book to help you unwind that and work on that healing process. Oh yeah. No, I, I have my entire life. Um, when I was, I taught school for 25 years and people were saying, you know, you really should be in this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this field full time. And it was like, I <clears throat> have a lot of years to go to retirement. And when I retire, I'll do this full time. And, I kept saying it and kept wishing, really wishing, that I could stop teaching and do this work full time. But, excuse me, at the time, single parent kid in college. No, no, no. You don't. You don't get it. Give away your stability at that moment in time. That's that's just stupid. And Mm -hmm. um, so I had a car accident. And I was forced into early retirement. And I could almost hear voices saying, if you had just done what we asked, we wouldn't have made it so serious. But you have such a damn hard head. And mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> it was the best move I made in my entire life. And, and it's been beneficial to me ever since. And but But it was like I fought it. And yet I knew it was the right thing to do. And I think sometimes that does happen. That that it you're, you're, a lot. you're and and people don't pay attention to those synchronistic things, they, those coincidences that happen in their lives. That the spirit is trying to tell them something. And if you keep track of them, if you take a look at you know where they're applied to your life you can get an idea as to maybe there should be changes and make the changes before that damn two-by-four comes because that two-by-four has hit me a couple of times and it is not a pleasure. I became well acquainted with the two-by-four, you know, (laughs) and taught me the word surrender, which I don't even like saying out loud. Um, You know, but most people, all right, I don't want to say most people, There are a lot of people on this planet that don't listen, you know, and I'm going to say they don't listen to themselves. But when I say they don't listen to themselves, what I'm really saying is they don't listen to spirit. Because spirit is constantly giving us little suggestions of, hey, maybe you should do this. Or, hey, what about this? And it's never in a mean, overbearing way. It's just kind of like, hey, what about this? 
and you can listen or you don't have to. But after a while, the things that happen that are trying to get your attention to the thing you're supposed to be doing get louder and louder and bigger and bigger until finally something happens. You get sick, you get in a car accident, you know, whatever. Yeah. All to just get your attention. And, you know, I think that was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me in my entire life so far. But, you know, it's it's kind of like you you get into a habit, you think you know what, what you're doing, and – and then I think one of the biggest questions that, that I, I get and that comes up in my life is, is this an ego talking or is it my spirit talking? How do you tell the difference between? You know, so as I was saying, you know, when it's spirit, it always comes through in that soft voice. <clears throat> Usually it's, a couple of words, a short phrase. You know, if you're a really visual person, you'll get a picture. Usually when uh-huh. it's spirit, if you ask a question, this is a better way of saying it, if you ask a question, spirit will always answer. And it does, you know. So I shared this story, and it was like the totally lamest thing, but it was just so true. So it was right before Christmas, and my dishwasher wasn't running, and I get it to stop, and I open it up, and there was like four inches of liquid in the bottom. So I call the repair guy, and he goes, you know, it's almost Christmas. I'm not going to be back until after the first of the year, after the holidays. You know, and there's, I live in Podunkville, you know, so and this guy came very highly recommended. So I'm like, okay. But I didn't want to leave all that liquid in the bottom. That was gross. So I'm sitting on the floor with a coffee cup and some ShamWow towels thinking I'm just going to, like, scoop this liquid up and put it in a pot and then dump it outside. That was the thought. Well, it wasn't being particularly successful in, in going. So I was like, hmm, I wonder what else I could use. And the first thing that comes into my mind is the freaking turkey baster. And I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, turkey bait. Well, you know, it wouldn't have been one of my go-to things to think about, the turkey baster. And so I went and got the turkey baster and basted all that water out in like 20 minutes. Bam, done. Yeah. And I'm like, thank you. You know, <laughs> but it's, it's that kind of listening, you know. And a lot of times people will just sit there and get those messages and be like, Nah, nah, or they try to talk themselves out of it, which is the ego. I'm going to share a different story, which is not in that book. And this was a number of years ago. Well, actually, a lot of years ago, over 20 at this point. And this is when Whole Life Expo did big shows all around the country. And they were coming back to Texas. They had been done an event in Austin which to me was a good location because it was like three hours from Dallas, three hours from Houston, three hours from San Antonio, three big major metropolitan areas. And this time they decided to do it in Dallas, which didn't make any sense to me. And But I've done a lot of their shows. They've always been very good for me, blah, blah, blah. And I just kept getting this, eh, I just wasn't feeling it. But then my ego was like, but, you know, you always do really good at those events, and it's, you know, right there, and you don't have to get a hotel because you just drive over there and blah, blah, blah. And and I would check in, and it's like, but I just am not feeling it. So finally, I said, you know what? You're not feeling it. So own the fact that you're not feeling it, and stop trying to talk yourself into it. Because I knew that was spirit, and that it was my ego trying to talk me into it. So it's the weekend of Whole Life Expo, and it just so happened that a 757 crashed into the side of the twin, one twin tower, and then another 20 minutes later, another plane crashed into the other twin tower, and all airline travel was shut down. So oh, none of the out-of-town speakers showed up. <clears throat> 
A lot of the vendors didn't show up. They opened the doors for free for anybody that would come. It would have been a bust event. Oh, but, yeah. And so I just sat there. I mean, you know, 9-11, super, super terrible. But on the other level, I was kind of happy I listened because I would have invested. I mean, their boots are expensive. I mean, they're like 1200 bucks. I know. You know I've so done a been, couple of them. <laughs> You know, so it's kind of like, ooh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, like, getting me to listen to myself on that one. Yeah. I, you know, it's yeah. funny. I I have a new concept with, with things as far as new adventures to go on, and it's if I've been there and done that, I'm not going to do it again. So mm-hmm. you have to pre- you have to present me with something that is new and unique. Otherwise, I'm not going to invest myself in it. And mm-hmm. it's worked out so far. Um, and I think I think a lot of the stuff. I, I truly believe that we need to to, you know, your car has to go in every year for a once over. And I think we need to do that with ourselves as far as our reactions and our attitudes and the way that we're dealing with 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 society as a whole. And I, I think that part of part of the book that, that I just adored was was how, you know, you you're you're reinventing yourself and I tell people all the time that you you create your reality by your perception of it. And you know, if your perception is crap, so is gonna be your reality. And it's a matter of mm-hmm. Finding finding that wonderful place inside of you that is just always so happy and joyful. And if you're in that place as much of the time as you can be, um, life is even better. And, and so it's a matter of understanding that you have the power to create what you want in your life. And 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 here's the kicker, but but you're not the one that is really – making all the choices and decisions, it has to be the spirit within you, not the ego. And so long as you leave the selections to the higher consciousness or the higher awareness or the spirit within, whichever terminology floats your boat, if you if you can let go the reins and allow spirit to help you along, you get help beautifully. You truly but do. But a lot of people, a lot of people see the world through a cup half full. And when you start changing that narrative inside of yourself, like one of the things that I discovered about myself pretty early on was I, I think I'm a lot better now. I don't know, but I was a pretty good complainer. And I do say this in the book, uh, dang, it was me all along, was that some of the best stories that I tell and the funniest stories I tell are of me complaining about something. Absolutely. Period. And, um, you know, but one day I was getting a cup of coffee. It's, it wasn't Starbucks, but like a Starbucksy kind of place. And, um, and I'm talking, and I caught myself complaining. So then I just started paying attention to that. You know, so if you're a complainer, you're constantly keeping yourself in negative thoughts. You're constantly looking at the world from a cup half full versus having gratitude for things. You know, if if you're if you say thank you and express gratitude for the things that happen in your life, then you can't look at it from a negative place. You know, so me coming on here to hang out with you and your listeners, it's like, you know, this morning it's like, okay, I got my interview with Barbara. Thank you. You know, like after the show, I'll be like, thank you, good interview. You know, and not yeah. and just have it be good because that's when you start attracting the good, but it's also you're recognizing and seeing the good in other things versus the crap. And so we're so used to only seeing and only looking for the crap that all we're surrounded by is crap because that's all we can see. 
And exactly. we can't see the flowers in the field, and we can't see anything except the crap. <laughs> well, there's plenty of that, that's for sure. But, but you know, mm-hmm. the reality is if um, I, I know that I, I personally – try very hard to always be in that positive place. I'm not always there. I admit it. I have moments. But, but you know, it, it, the, the more you can be in that place and be excited about life, uh, the more exciting life actually becomes. And the more evident um, the, the, the spirit shoving things your way. And I, I know mm-hmm. a lot of times I, I write a lot. And every now and then I'll be whipping a log on something and I and I, I I like to say most of what I write is channeled, but there's another level of channeling as well that is more inspirational than a lot of the stuff that I do. There's different levels. And at at many different times suddenly there will be a stop in what I'm writing and there will be another title and something else that comes in and then I'll go on with the other stuff and it will where the hell did that come from? But, man, that's good. Did I really write it? And mm-hmm. so it, it, it's a matter of if you're opening those channels, you get all sorts of really good, profound stuff. That Interesting you, you stuff. Wonder, oh, gosh, yeah. And, and well, and one so of the I, things that you said is that, you know, you try to have a good attitude and you try to stay positive and that you're not always there. And I really appreciate you saying that and being honest about it because it's true for everybody. It's true for everybody. You know, and I kind of like in being happy or having, being, cultivating happiness, uh, to like dieting. You know, it's kind of like dieting isn't hard. You have to not eat food, and yeah. you have to change your relationship with food, you know. So whatever that is, whatever is keeping you drawn to, like, sit on the sofa with the bag of chips and then the bag of Oreos or whatever that is, it's like you need to raise your awareness so that you can change what's going on inside, you know, so that – because to me, dieting is about a lifestyle change. It's not necessarily just about counting calories. Um, uh-huh. But we're we're not always there. So even when we're dieting, you know, we have those days where we do eat the bag of Oreo cookies. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's okay. oh, yeah. You know, you have to have that be okay and give yourself permission to have that bad day. And maybe go back and go, wow, I wonder what triggered that off. And what caused me to want to eat that whole bag of cookies? And the same thing, if you're having a bad emotional day or you're feeling down inside or you're cranky or I call it bad brain, you're having a bad brain day, it's okay. The goal is to just get back into your good place and stay there as long as you can because the more you practice and the more you maintain that good energy with your focus on having good energy, one of the things you'll notice is that the time that you spend in between the days of having bad brain will start to become further apart and further apart and further apart. And the amount of time that you spend in a negative place will start getting smaller and smaller to where, you know, there might be something happening and you're really cranky about it, but by morning you're fine again. Oh, yeah. I think one of the fun things that I do, and I'm not suggesting anybody else do this, but one of the fun things that I do, I love to, when I'm in the grocery store, find somebody who's all by themselves and alone and tell them how great they look or how pretty they are or what, you know. And as I roll on by, you can feel the glow that comes off of them. It's just the coolest thing in the world. And perfect mm-hmm. strangers, I don't have to, you know, don't have to talk to them any more than that. And it, it's somebody once accused me of being a Pollyanna, and I, I don't believe I am, but I am positive. <laughs> and if the two are the same, then I guess I am. But, but I find that that being nice to people gets me more than than mm-hmm. not being nice. It, it's just that simple. 
and and I think that when people understand that that you know what you put out comes back to you absolutely law of cause and effect and if you're putting out you know sadness and all of that and and you know it's okay to to be sad it's okay to have grief and it's it's okay but it's a matter of <clears throat> are you going to hold on to it and let it cloud your entire life or are you going to process it and 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 not hide it but do it privately where where you can talk to yourself about what's going on instead of impacting everyone around you. Mhm. So I have a girlfriend and it seems like we cycle like opposite each other, you know, so mm-hmm. I'll have a couple of days where I'm having bad brain, you know, and I'll call her up and I'm like, I got bad brain. Yeah, And then, like, the next week, she's like, I'm having a panic attack, you know. And so we have really been supporting each other in our healing process, you know. Mm-hmm. And it makes it so that, you, you know, for me, having somebody to talk to, you know, makes it so that you can, like, talk through it. Because sometimes what you need is to talk through it. I know for me, I need to verbalize and then I can go, oh, yeah, you know, because all kinds of stuff comes out of my mouth that I just am like, oh, yeah, that's kind of <laughs> interesting. And I just said that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but then no, you're right. Having... So I don't have to sit there and crank to everybody. You know what I mean? <laughs> I This is my... This is my crank buddy, you know, and I yeah. listen to her like her getting up all my puking, you know, so it's it's fair game. <laughs> it's fair game. But then you don't have to, like, lay that on everybody else around you. Oh, yeah. And <clears throat> I know at, at my grandmother's funeral, she was 98, I think, or she was old. And the family was there at the funeral home for the, you know, the viewing or whatever. And my sister came up to me and she said, see that old lady over there? And I said, yeah. She said, don't ask her how she is. She will tell you. And oh, I had a lot of friends like that. It's like the biggest mistake was, hey, how are you? Big mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Better to say, you're looking good tonight, you know, and <laughs> letting it go at that. I, every time I think that I, I may get one of the, although there's sometimes that people need to talk to someone, and you know I'm fine with that. I can I cannot take it on, but um, you know it's it's kind of like you you kind of have to be careful about where you where you open yourself up to that kind of um, emotional flooding by someone else. But you know I've had friends that. You know, they'd call you up or you'd call them up and you would, like, be social and do this stupid thing and be like, hey, how's it going? And it's just like, and that's the only word to get out of your mouth because they just, yeah. like, barrage you with their crap. And it's just like, ugh. Neither I don't know. Say, when... They're not in my life anymore, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have found that I've had people who call me and say, oh, I just lost my job. And, and my response is always, oh, that's so great. You really didn't like the job anyhow. You were talking about wanting to go somewhere else. You never took on the responsibility of just quitting, so the universe did it for you. So where are you going? And mm-hmm. it stops them dead in their tracks. Mm-hmm. But 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 often that's what happens. You know, they can, people complain, complain, complain. Don't take action, and then the universe kind of listens and listens and says, "Oh hell, she's not going to do it herself. Let's just fire her." And and mm-hmm. that's how it works. Yeah. Well, not quite that way, but kind of. And it, it's sort of I mean, like you know, sometimes sometimes there's a lesson that you need to be learning in the firing because maybe you were yeah. a jerk, or maybe you had really bad work behavior or work ethics. You know, so sometimes it's the universe, but sometimes there's a lesson in there as well that you need to potentially pay heed to. Oh, always there's a lesson, always. Mm-hmm. And and it's just a matter of, and sometimes it's more than one. Yes, but ma'am. I, I, have, I have found that, that your books are just so down to earth and and 
just I know we're running sort of out of time here, but can talk about your 17 um, second count. 17 second rule. I yeah. love the 17 second rule. It is one of my personal favorite things. So the 17 second rule is like the five second rule. You know, so a piece of food falls on the floor in the kitchen, you got five seconds to pick it up before. You know, and you have to throw it away. So that's the five-second rule. The Uh 17-second rule says that when a negative thought comes into your head, you have 17 seconds to shift the energy. And so after that 17 seconds, the thought starts to build up momentum, and it builds up some speed, and then the next 17 seconds happens, and it's getting more momentum. You know, and then maybe another 17 seconds happens, and that initial thought might branch off into a parallel thought, you know, and then another 17 seconds, and you get another parallel thought. So now <clears throat> what was initially one thought becomes this thing, this massive thing that you are just in, enmeshed in. And so... The goal is to catch it in the first 17 seconds, you know, but if you catch it, if you sit there and go, wow, I really have bad brain now because you're all like stuck in the middle of all of these negative thoughts, that's okay too because the goal and the hope is to have that awareness, you know, and so Uh even if you're down the rabbit hole, it's like you can at least go, wow, I have bad brain right now, you know, and let that do or learn the lesson, do some journaling, do some breathing, do some tapping, you know, use some tools, whatever, to break that cycle. With the goal of catching it when it's 17 seconds, so the 17 seconds is the goal, you know, and the practice is catching it as soon as possible. That's the practice. Because it really is possible to catch it in the first 17 seconds, if you promise. Oh, yeah. Well, I I have, um, I'm, I'm very creative. So there are moments when something will happen and I will take off and run in the negative area faster than anything you've ever, yeah, oh, I understand this is because this, 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 and this, and, and it's not any of that stuff. And so your 17-second rule really has helped me a lot because when I when I get smacked with something that, that takes my breath away and it's like, uh-oh, this is 17 seconds. I have to find something creative to do. And let me tell you, I have cleaned cupboards. I have done laundry. I have done all sorts. I mean, like you said, my house is clean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and it really doesn't matter what you do, you know, whether you do breathing, whether you go to the gym and exercise or go take a walk out in the woods. You know, I I have found that when it's really past the 17 seconds, you know, like I'm working on a good five minutes here that I'm stuck in this thinking, that's when I really have to, you know, like go clean, go rake leaves. Uh-huh. You know, go do something that's just really physical because it helps me burn off the emotional energy that tends to be tied to it. Oh, yeah. You know, and it, it helps it bring also, me back down to earth. It also um, helps with people who have panic attacks. Um, oftentimes, you know, with a panic attack, I will suddenly do laundry and fold laundry or I will I will do something that is very physical so that I'm not – thinking I'm dying, it, well, mm-hmm. it, it might even be I'm dying. God, I've got to make the bed. I've got to straighten up the house. I can't have people finding me in this kind of disarray. And before I'm done, I have cleaned and everything is neat, and I didn't die. Well, damn, mm-hmm. you know, that worked. <laughs> well, you know, and so, the goal is the goal is to just have something to focus on. So if the thing to focus on is cleaning, then clean. You know, if the focus is to have one of those coloring books and color, then color, you know, with all of your attention and awareness on that, because those kinds of things will help to discharge what's going on inside. Absolutely. Your your book is full of exercises. It's full of 
suggestions. It's full of all sorts of wonderful material that um, if anybody is looking to do a little bit of rewiring or rewriting, rewriting or or whatever, it's it's a fabulous book. And of course, your your dance book with the narcissist and the empath. I adore. I, the I've given that away. Dance of the empath and narcissist, and then this yeah. new one is dang, it was me all along, which is available, you know, at all your major booksellers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or if people want an autograph copy, they can come to my website, which is soulhealer.com. That's soulhealer.com. Very cool. And you have a radio show, too. Yes. Um, so I do a podcast Thursday night. It streams on Facebook. It streams on YouTube, and it streams on Twitter. It's called Thursday Night Live with Dr. Rita Louise. And I do like a 15-minute intro where I talk about a topic. Maybe we cover a hands-on technique. And then it it is opened up for people to in the chat room to ask questions, get free on-air psychic readings, join the fun. You just never know what's going to happen. At them. Yeah, it's a very, very cool show. It's I, I have watched many of them, and they are always entertaining. And, and not only that, but they're very informational. So you can't help but learn something from this lady if she's talking. <laughs> so, and you talk a lot, um, <clears throat> as do I. Um, so I, I, I thank you so much for being here. I have thunder and lightning here, so... Um, <laughs> okay. I'm going to I'm going to um call it a night and and thank you so much. I so appreciate everything you've done. All of your the two books that I've read have been absolutely so precious because they have such wonderful information in them. I highly recommend them and and I I hope people get them both because they both really teach you a lot about yourself. Thank you, Barbara, and thanks for having me. Ah, it has been my pleasure, and and I hope we get to do it again soon. Okay. Good night, now. Okay, everybody, thank you. I have a huge storm coming down on me, so we're going to make it brief and fast. Mark has a show tomorrow night, and I'll be back next Monday. Looking forward to seeing you, hearing from you, and hoping you have a great evening.